fascinating. Hello and welcome back. Today I want to talk about impedance matching by looking at how this can be achieved with pieces of transmission line. What I'm talking about is stub impedance matching networks, a narrow band technique most commonly used at relatively high frequency when the lengths involved become relatively small. Now in practice, stub matching circuits can be built with transmission lines, either in the form of traces on a printed circuit board or as pieces of coax cable. So for today, this is an example of the circuit we will be testing later on. So this is a matching circuit designed for 160 megahertz. But before doing that, let's first understand how this thing is even supposed to work and how to calculate the exact necessary transmission line dimensions. So the fundamental principle on which this sort of matching relies is that a transmission line will create an impedance transformation based on its length, characteristic impedance, and the connected load impedance. This allows the creation of virtually any impedance, both real and reactive. Now, as you can already see, the mathematics behind this is not that easy. I will leave some references in the description if you're curious, but I will not go into too many details today. If you would be interested in that, just let me know in the comments. Now, one form of transmission line impedance matching is based on the quarter wavelength transformer. Here, the length is fixed to a quarter wavelength line, and by using the appropriate transmission line impedance, two real only impedances can be matched. This, however, does not work with complex impedances. Now, a real and complex impedance can be matched using series transmission lines, but for this, normally two pieces of transmission line are needed. One can have any user given characteristic impedance, and the length will be calculated based on the exact reactance transformation needed. So this is used to transform the complex impedance into a real only impedance in the middle. And the second piece of transmission line has a fixed length of a quarter wavelength, but this needs a specific characteristic impedance, which is calculated based on the two real impedances that need to be matched. So the big problem with both of these methods is that you will need at least one piece of transmission line with a non-standard impedance. Something that can be done on a substrate like a PCB, but it cannot be done with pieces of cable unless you get really, really lucky. Stub impedance matching, however, does allow the matching of a complex impedance to a real one. And it can also be done with any cable impedance. It's just the lengths that are variable. So the circuit can be implemented in multiple ways. There are quite a few topologies in common use. So let's look at them one by one. The first type involves using two transmission lines, one in series in between the two impedances, and one is in parallel on the real only side impedance. Now this can be implemented in two ways. So the stub can either be terminated into an open circuit or into a short circuit. Now, when designing such a circuit, you can commonly impose the transmission line impedance and just calculate the transmission line lengths. And while well, the really interesting thing is that the characteristic impedance of the transmission line can be the same as the real only input impedance. So for example, if you want to match some complex load impedance to say 50 ohms, you can use pieces of 50 ohm transmission line to do this. You do not need some special impedance value transmission line. Now, one variation of the circuit involves using the matching stub in series rather than in parallel. Here, the same basic ideas apply. So the stub needs to be on the real only side of the circuit and the transmission line impedances can be fixed and only the lengths determined. Now, there is one problem with both of these circuits that will generate the third type to be discussed today. And that is that if you need to make any adjustments or make a matching for different impedances, you need to adjust both transmission line lengths. With the stub, it's not that hard, especially if the open-ended version is used, you can easily make cuts to fine tune it or switch between different lengths. But the series line is quite difficult to modify in a real life use case, since it needs to be connected at both ends. 
So the last version to highlight is the two parallel stub use case. Here an extra stub is used on the other impedance side. And the main advantage here is that other than the line impedances, you can also keep the interconnecting line length a constant. So the matching is done just by adjusting the two stub lengths. Now here there still is a limitation that only a certain range of impedances can be matched, but usually if you run into any problems, you can have an extra bit of line added onto the complex impedance side. And that of course can stay of fixed length. Now I found two main ways of calculating this sort of impedance matching. Either a Smith chart based calculation, which can get just a bit complicated, especially if you've never used a Smith chart before, or there is the analytical solution, going through multiple formulas with some very fun complex numbers. Now I could not find a ready made tool that applies any of these methods, but I did find the way in which they should be applied. So I ended up making my own spreadsheet to do the various calculations. Now the calculations that I used are based on a sequence described in the microwave engineering book by David M. Bozar, a book which among other places is also available for free on the Internet Archive website. So this book contains a great deal of good information on various microwave circuitry stuff. So I highly recommend that you check this book out. Anyway, coming to the spreadsheet, you will find the link to this in the description. And here I added four different sections, one for calculating the complex impedance as seen with an arbitrary piece of transmission line, and three others for the various stub matching topologies. Now I might expand on this document at some point, maybe make it a bit more clear, but anyway the main idea here is that you need to insert the desired real and complex impedances on the left side, as well as the frequency at which the matching should work, and while the calculations assume that the transmission line used for the matching is the same value as the real impedance used to be matched, and a bit of calculations later, you get multiple solutions expressed both in terms of time delay, so in nanoseconds, or in meters of transmission line. And here we have the option of a velocity factor of 1, or for a user given other value of velocity factor. So you get the solutions for the open or short circuited stub, and for each of these there are two possible options available. Now just as an observation for the two stub calculation sheet, based on the exact complex load that you're trying to connect to, it is possible for no solution to exist. So this is checked under this parameter. Now if there is no solution possible, then an extra bit of optional series line can be inserted in between the matching circuit and the complex load. So this is defined under the D0 parameter. Now I will not be going into the details of the various calculations since I will probably get something wrong. But if you check out the reference, that should give you all the necessary details. Anyway, let's now check out some of the results of these calculations. So for today's simulations, as a test load, I will be using a 100 ohm resistor in series with a 100 nano Henry inductor, which at around 160 megahertz gives a complex impedance of 100 plus 100 J ohms. Now, if you don't believe me, we can quickly check this using a dot net statement. And well, after simulating, we can look at the impedance as seen from the signal source side and plotting it using Cartesian representation. So when we go to the value of 160 megahertz, we can see our 100 plus 100 J ohms. Now, just for reference, since we're talking about impedance matching, I also calculated a set of LC matching circuits. So once with the inductor in series and once with the inductor in parallel. So I made these mainly to highlight the exact response shape that we are supposed to be getting. So looking from the signal source side, our signal source will be matched to our complex load when the signal amplitude passes through the minus 6 decibel point and the phase passes through 0 degrees. And well, for both our circuits, this is occurring at exactly 160 megahertz. Now we can also look on the load side, specifically at the signal present on the 
real resistive bit. And here at the same 160 megahertz on both our loads, we are seeing a maximum of minus three decibels of signal. So since the resistor is double that of the signal source, the signal value is of double value. So that's why we get our minus three decibel amplitude. Anyway, moving to the stub matching circuits, I have the same basic setup as before. So a 50 ohm signal source and our complex load, but the matching is built from pieces of transmission line based on the calculation sheet. So starting with the parallel stubs, we have four different cases, two with an open-ended stub and two with a short-circuited stub. So the calculation sheet has given us two valid results for both cases. Now, if we look at the signal level on all of our resistors, so first, starting with the open-ended stubs, we get our maximum at 160 megahertz, and the same thing for the short-circuited stubs. Again, the maximum is occurring at 160 megahertz. So we can see that the matching is working in all cases. It's just that the exact response shape is different. Now, in general, the best implementation is either the one that gives the specific desired shape, so maybe you want this signal dip, maybe you just want a steady slope, or it will be the one that can be built with the shortest pieces of transmission line. So in each of these cases, there are different lengths of transmission line needed. Anyway, now moving on to the series stub implementations, we have more or less the same story as before with a few observations. So to get the simulator to not give any errors, I had to connect the open-ended stubs to ground using some very large value resistors. So this will not be needed in real life, of course, but it is needed in the simulator to prevent errors from occurring. Now, if we look at the response of these circuits, so first of all, the open-ended stubs, again, they are giving a good matching at 160 megahertz, and while well, the short-circuited stubs are giving the same result. So each of these circuits is providing a matching at 160 megahertz, but they are giving a slightly different response shape. Finally, looking at the double stub circuits, if we look at the simulation results, all of them will be giving a different result, but a good matching will be obtained at 160 megahertz. Now, one interesting observation to be made about these circuits is that you can combine an open-ended stub with a short-circuited stub. So even in this case, we are getting a good result and matching. So the two stubs do not need to be of the same type. Final thing to look at is the fact that adding an extra piece of transmission line, so on the complex impedance side, will not affect things. So all of the other stubs need to be recalculated, but in this case as well, we are getting good matching at our 160 megahertz point. So the calculation sheet seems to be giving decently good results. Now, the simulation seems to indicate that the calculations are implemented correctly and that everything in the world is nice and perfect. That's until you try to apply any of these. So one of the big issues that I've run into is getting the dimensions right. Now, with any transmission line based structure, whether it's a filter, a matching circuit, or a balen, or well, anything else, there are two key parameters that you need to ensure. Characteristic impedance and propagation delay. Get any of these wrong for any of the involved pieces and the circuit doesn't work. So the first thing I did was build the complex load, a basic 100 nano Henry inductor in series with a 100 ohm resistor, which somehow at 160 megahertz gave a complex impedance of 91.2 ohms plus 102.4 J ohms. I guess there's a bit of stray capacitance involved. Anyway, based on the calculation sheet, I took the shortest combination of lines for a open-ended single parallel stub matching circuit. And based on this, I measured out some pieces of 50 ohm transmission line and assembled it all. So to test everything out, I connected the pieces of coax to a small frame I had around that already has these B and C connectors mounted into it. And from this thing, one side goes to the light VNA for measurements, 
and the other side has the complex load attached. And well, here is where I made a bit of a mistake. See, it doesn't matter how precisely you measure out your cables and how precisely you cut them, if you add in extra bits of transmission line. So considering that my lines are in the tens of centimeters of length, adding in an extra, say, five centimeters of adapters and connectors is quite a big deal. So of course, the circuit to begin with doesn't really work as expected. So there is quite a bit of fine tuning needed to get the desired response and to compensate for all of the added in bits. Now, I did quite a bit of fine tuning and here the problem of the series line becomes quite obvious. Once you cut, you also need to resolder. It would be a similar issue for short circuit ended lines, but with the open ended line, it's much easier to work with. So you just cut and then you're done. Anyway, after I got fed up with trying to improve on this, the best result that I got at 160 megahertz was an impedance of 39.3 ohms plus 0.3 J ohms, as seen from the 50 ohm side. So the circuit is working as expected. The exact shape of the impedance curve is exactly as predicted by the simulator, but the exact values are just a bit off, mainly because of the cable lengths. And probably the cables have a small impedance deviation as well. But all in all, there is quite a good correlation between the practical circuit and the predicted simulated values. Now, stub impedance matching is a legitimate and widespread method, especially at high frequency. But getting it to work correctly can be a bit of an endeavor. There are two fundamental topology choices that can be done, however, to make life easy. One is to use an open ended stub rather than a short circuited stub. This removes the need for a short circuit reconnection after fine tuning was done. And the double stub circuit helps by removing the need to adjust the series element, which again needs a complicated reconnection procedure. Now, the best choice of topology will be, of course, use case dependent. Some will give more desirable wideband frequency responses. But you still need to keep in mind that the circuit actually needs to be practically built. And with that said, hope you enjoyed this video. And if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you might want to check out. And if you want to be updated with my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.